Singularity University Exponential Medicine Day 2, 2018, is now done. Let's take a quick look at some of the high points and some of the really interesting things that happened in today's lectures. And there's a lot of them. There was over 30 different speakers today. Let's see how long this uh, summary actually takes. So the day started with Moria Gunn, who's a NPR host. And the theme here was talking about biopharma and biopharmaceuticals. Biopharmaceuticals are uh, drugs which are made from biologic sources, such as blood products, hormones, immune factors, vaccines, monoclonal antibodies, or gene therapy. And one of the interesting takeaways is that many of these medications are becoming first in class, meaning that there previously was not a medication in the therapeutic class that they're being developed for. And so this makes uh, biopharma a highly innovative uh, area within pharmaceuticals, but unfortunately, this still remains um, not influencing neglected diseases. And we know that there's over a billion people who suffer from one or more of these neglected diseases. And so there's a uh, institute which was called Drugs for Neglected Diseases, which was mentioned in pa the presentation. And it is worth uh, mentioning as well that um, Moria had commented on the difference of biotech from synthetic synthetic biology. And biotech involves cutting and pasting of DNA, which is what we've been doing for a number of years, whereas synthetic biology involves actually printing whole molecules or whole organisms. And this is something which we're going to discuss a little bit later in the next presentations. Next, Andrew Hessel, CEO of Human Genomics and Nanotechnology at Singularity University, uh, spoke very interesting presentation. He's been interested in trying to understand the relationship between biology and carbon, between uh, cells, which you can think about as mini computers, and potentially their own 3D printers, and the fact that they self-replicate, and how we move from a chemical world where we manipulate simply chemical constructs to being able to actually uh, design and develop with DNA tools. The uh, great NIH cost per genome graph was shown. And I want uh, just to point out one crucial factor. This line here is showing Moore's Law, right, which is an exponential process in and of itself, but because it's displayed on an exponential uh, access, or sorry, on a logarithmic access, we're seeing a linear line. And so what actually happened here around 2008 is that the cost per genome began to fall at a rate exceeding Moore's Law. This is the really cool part about this story here. And now we've actually reached the point where the cost to sequence DNA is pretty much almost free. One of the companies which was mentioned here is one called Roswell Biotechnologies. And the hope is that this chip will be able to sequence uh, DNA ridiculously quickly and uh, with minimal cost. Andrew has become interested recently in this curve here. As we can see in red, the cost to sequence the average genome has dropped. And we see, conversely, a line in green rising progressively towards the right, showing the value which one gets from the data which was sequenced in a genome. And we're now, we've passed this economic inflection point where it's more valuable to sequence a genome because of the economic benefit of the data which you get than the actual cost which is incurred. And this means that there's now network effects where companies will try to want to sequence as many genomes as possible for free in some ways because meaning that the patient doesn't have to pay because they'll be able to extract more value from this uh, genomic data. So companies which were mentioned uh, that are being able to try to harness this are uh, Nebula Genomics and Lunda DNA. Now, these companies are hoping to be able to connect people to uh, who have genomic data and connect them uh, to companies which are looking to sequence genomic data. And he was suggesting that in some ways, there are certain people in the world where companies may want to pay higher amounts of money to try to access to their genetic code and to be able to sequence their genomes. And so if anyone's seen Gattaca, 
this uh, does sound a little bit reminiscent where your DNA and your genetic code may be more valuable based on the attributes that you have. We move into showing that there is projects not just in a human sequencing, but one called the Earth Biogenome Project, whose goal is to sequence all the genomes of all eukaryotes uh, on Earth. There is also some comments on the fact that we're trying to uh, use DNA in synthetic biology. This is, again, trying to print entire DNA molecules. And some new companies which are trying to do this using enzymes such as DNA script molecular assemblies and nuclear nucleix. And this builds on the work being done by other companies such as Twist Bioscience, which just had their IPO last week, where they're uh, using a different process trying to create synthetic biology. Ginkgo Works Bioworks, uh, sorry, yeah, Ginkgo Bioworks is a company which calls themselves the organism company, and they're trying to use biology and uh, synthetic biology to create manufacturing and other types of processes. And a lot of this work, which builds on the Human Genome Project, is now being done through Genome Project Right or GP Right. And this is kind of the second half of the Human Genome Project, where the first half was trying to sequence the genome, and now we're in the second half, which is trying to be able to treat any genetic disease. But in order to be able to do this, we need to be able to write to the genome. And GP Right is trying to do research and coordinate efforts in this area. Because the ultimate goal is that we'll be able to produce N of 1 medications, meaning medications and treatments that are unique to a person's uh, cells, such as the Camara uh, human T cell uh, treatments that we saw in yesterday's presentation. And although the costs to do these right now are several million dollars, the costs will fall just as the cost to sequence the genomes also fell. One of the concerns, of course, is that it actually is very cheap right now to create a new synthetic biology such as viruses. You can go online and essentially create a synthetic virus for your dogs uh, and receive it uh, for both minimal cost and with minimal effort. And this creates a huge concern uh, because of the biosecurity risks and uh, we'll need new ways to monitor for these types of biosecurity risks. At the same time though, uh, it was proposed that there's a huge potential because this actually almost opens up an app store for, uh, for humans in some ways. And we're seeing this in the fact that uh, there's different ways which we're using CRISPR or uh, IVG and the cost to have a a garage biology or a genetic engineering home lab kit is actually not very expensive. And so we're gonna see where this goes over the number of years, but the thought is that in just a few years time, all you'll require is a laptop and you'll be able to use uh, the software tools to ship synthetic biology products to your house. We'll move on now to the next section, which was by Jamie Metzel. And uh, he's the author of a book coming out this year called Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. He starts off by asking the question, well, we initially had something, we first found out that there was a book of life by Watson and Crick. And then the Human Genome Project told us how to read the book of life. And we're now entering into the next phase, which is how to write into the book of life. As he suggested, Human beings are another form of information technology. And one of the uh, thoughts is kind of building on the previous lecture that we're going to be able to uh, go into software to design new synthetic biologies and then print them out. Uh, he commented that when he does this type of work, he actually likes to insert a barcode into the DNA so that it's possible to know who produced that new synthetic biology. And of course, we're going to have to begin to think about how uh, to create central registries to track these synthetic biologies. Some of the uh, work which is being done to create massive DNA data pools around the world includes in the UK. The NHS have committed to sequencing 5 million Britons over the next five years. In the USA, there is a plan called All of uh, Us, 
which is applying to sequence a million people. And of course, China, doing everything at a scale uh, far higher than the rest of the world, has a goal to sequence half of all newborns by the year 2020. And the interesting work will be when we compare the DNA records to the uh, physical medical records, such as the EHR, and trying to understand how phenotypic expression of disease and propensity for disease is reflected in the genetic code. And we're in a very early phase, it was suggested, of direct-to-consumer testing, of which you know many of the direct-to-consumer tests right now are bogus as far as what they claim to be able to predict, but our prediction accuracy will increase with time. And so as uh, it was said, um, Jamie predicts that the real destination will be an embryo selection, meaning that although right now embryo selection is only able to find a few single point mutations, uh, hair color and eye color, that in the future we'll be able to predict things uh, such as whether someone has a 50% chance of an outgoing personality. He imagines what the fertility clinic in the year 2030 may look like. And the thought is that someone probably the week prior to going to this clinic would have a screen graph taken because the thought is that you actually probably don't need sperm or embryo to actually uh, develop the cells required for um, mating as we can uh, sh show in female rats that you can uh, mate the two of them together by inducing uh, different ways to generate embryos from non-embryo uh, progenitor cells. And then you'll be able to uh, mate these different uh, selected uh, embryos together. In this case, we're seeing uh, uh, two mothers being uh, mated into one embryo, and then that embryo can be mated with another embryo. And the thought is that although gene editing it will have a particular uh, benefits, for instance, CRISPR technologies, that the uh, larger um, effects will be able to be seen with actual embryo selection uh, with the goal of trying to do mating preferences, uh, self-segregation, and evolutionary uh, principles. And so Jamie proposes that at one point in time, we had multiple different human uh, species concurrently on Earth and, eval and wonders if we'll be getting back to an area uh, similar to that. You know, he mentions that we'll need different regulations on a global level, just as we have global regulations. For instance, in 72, we passed against biologic weapons and chemical weapons in the 90s and landmines as well. Or uh, more recently in the 2000s, we passed national rules against, or international rules against cluster munitions. The thought is uh, what type of international uh, regulations and norms will we set around uh, synthetic biology, uh, embryo selection, and uh, human uh, genetic code manipulation. Now, brief editorial on my part. Uh, one, I, th I think that uh, these types of international rules will be probably very difficult, uh, given that probably China will have a very different position from uh, other countries on what the limits of this type of uh, work should be. And second, I think we just need to be uh, upfront about calling what thing a spade a spade you know this is by definition eugenics right uh, eugenics being quote a set of beliefs and practices that aim at it improving the genetic quality of a human population end quote and you know genetics was very sorry eugenics was very popular in the u.s in the 1920s and then essentially since the 1930s was considered now a reasonably fringe ideology but uh, Let's have a proper public discussion against exactly uh, what it is that these technologies can do. And um, let's not whitewash the, co the conversation just because it's something new and innovative. Too often in technology, what I'm seeing is that because we can do something with technology, the thought is that therefore it's probably a good thing and therefore we should do something with technology. When uh, in fact, there's a, a much more complicated historical uh, background that we really need to, I think, understand a lot better.
All right, sorry. Anyway, editorial over here. Let's go back into now session seven, which is on digitizing data, health, and life. We start off by a presentation from Ron uh, Blancer, who comes from Khalid in Israel, which is a really remarkable organization there. I've met several of their tech leads and uh, been very impressed. And, you know, he points out with the obvious facts that 30% of current care is futile, 45% of necessary interventions are missed, and the number three cause of death is medical error. So we need to do better. Now, Khalid there have an, their own custom EHR that they've used for over 20 years, and they have 4.5 million patients in it, so quite a lot of data. And they're trying to use this data to do preemptive care. We all know that the end goal is to be able to be told before you have your heart attack that you're going to have a heart attack or be able to prevent the heart attack in the first place. But right now, they are trying to do preventative care, uh, specifically in those patients who are high risk for dialysis and reducing their uh, risk factors. We saw a demonstration for a new product that they call uh, Ideal Health. And uh, this is a tool which makes it easy for patients to uh, choose which interventions they want to work on in improving their health. And using this tool, they can see the benefits of uh, reducing or modifying those risk factors for their different comorbidities. And it makes it easier to uh, visualize your own success. Really interesting presentation then on the work that Khalid did on the New England Journal of Medicine Sprint Data Challenge. Now, the Sprint was a big trial uh, looking at hypertension, and uh, this data set was published online with the hope to find novel clinical findings from uh, the data. And so what uh, Khalid did was they went in and they calculated for an individual patient uh, the risk stores, both for uh, potential benefits as well as potential harms based on that patient's um, or that file's individual um, medical characteristics. And then they went into that not just for one patient, but for all the patients in the data set. And so they calculated individual risk scores for each individual person. And the big thing that they found was that although the trial suggested that there was a benefit for the majority of patients, when you actually so, sorry, when the, the trial, although the trial found that on average there was benefit to the intensive treatment arm for patients, that when you actually go down to the patient level and calculate individual people's uh, risk scores, that more than half of the patients uh, would not qualify for a benefit. And what they then did was uh, turn this into a uh, mathematical model which you could go in and enter your own patient's uh, risk factors to calculate their own risk. And this was alone a really uh, great product they've uh, assembled. But then they've moved on to the next stage, which is something I've been talking about, is that we can then uh, use a machine learning tool to do prediction much better than a doctor. And we're seeing that in this trial. And then the next step is being able to understand what the patient's preferences are. And we can almost quantify those. And so what they did is, if you look on the slide here on the uh, video version or in the blog, you'll see that they have something called the severity rank, which was allowing the patient to go in and quantify uh, how important those particular uh, benefits or harms are to their health. And then that retweaks uh, the algorithm and will update the recommendation based on the patient's preferences. And so here we're getting uh, the benefit of machine prediction as well as with personalized patient preferences. Really love the work that they're doing here. Ends with a quote, Health systems will not be replaced by algorithms. However, health systems that do not use algorithms will be replaced by those who do. And of course, uh, the presentation ended by pointing out that physicians don't need more data, but what they do require is that when data is brought to them, it's brought to them at the right time and in a way which is accessible. We'll move on to Lonnie Ray, and she's the founder and CEO of Metal 
really great presentation. It all started when, unfortunately, she was hit by a bus, and then she began to collect her own medical data and try to manage some of her own care. And this difficult, this experience was very frustrating and difficult, and uh, combined with her experience as a medical student, having limitations trying to find pa patients' records, she founded Metal, which is a company which was trying to extract clinical data from EHRs. Of course, uh, there was lots of uh, interesting facts here, talking about the fact that there are over 15 billion faxes a year in healthcare. Uh, a small hospital may receive 30,000 faxes a day. Our medical records are extremely fragmented. And uh, this is uh, you know, not helped by the fact that there's many different formats which we're getting data into the system, paper, fax, various different standards. And uh, she said, you know, in healthcare, there's a line that if you've seen one implementation, you've seen just one implementation. And every individual implementation is entirely different in how they construct their system. A few interesting screenshots of metal. What it can do is it can extract data, it can index it, and then it can compile it so it can be used. We see here data which was extracted from a paper file which was scanned in. And then you can go in and you can click on that data element and it will link you to the PDF file so you can view it on the original paper form if you like. Very slick interface. I actually, um, I've been, I've, it's nice to see someone's doing this because this is something I've been interested uh, to try to do myself. But now that it looks like there's already a tool out there, uh, I would be interested to give uh, Metal a trial. Of course, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting problems to solve, like how do you know what the doctor meant when they wrote AFP? Do they mean alpha fetoprotein or atypical facial pain? And so we're able to use these uh, new AI techniques to try to uh, classify what the doctor was likely uh, intending to write when those words were written and be able to classify these terms more accurately. Now, unfortunately, um, in the last year, Lonnie developed Eller's Danlow syndrome, and uh, she tells the story at the end of her experience, trying to get to the bottom of her own disease, uh, get through the genetics, and help find a treatment uh, through actually allergy shots, given the fact that it was a mast cell mediate process. Move into a presentation by Poppy Crum, who's a chief scientist at Dolby Laboratories. Very interesting presentation here. It starts off with talking about empathy. And uh, this was some paintings by Francis Bacon. And the thought is that part of the visual distortions we're seeing probably were related to uh, a scotoma that he, he had, which was affecting his uh, visual field perception. And she wonders about how uh, empathy will change as we move forward based off of the devices we have around us in our homes. And in fact, these devices may know more about our emotional and mental state than the physician in the clinic. As she says, our bodies give off deterministic signals, even if we try to hide them. And let's walk through a few of the ones which were discussed. The first was the pupil. As she says, the pupil doesn't lie. And in the past, eye tracking, pupil tracking technology was very expensive, you know, in the area of about $20,000. I even tried to buy a few, some of this uh, to do user interface testing a year ago, still very expensive. But the price of this is dropping rapidly. You know, a lot of different technologies such as AR and VR are very interested in these. And so we will have uh, pupil tracking technology pretty ubiquitous in our devices in the coming years. And we can uh, watch the physiologic responses to pupil size uh, as a way to actually see people's underlying uh, psychological state. We can also look at uh, galvanic skin response, which again doesn't lie. Here's a chart of people's uh, skin response as they were watching uh, soccer. And you can see at the penalty kick, there's the peak reaction, which then had a dramatic fall off after the penalty kicks. Similarly, we can use non-invasive tools such as thermal imaging, looking at people's faces to quantify uh, when they're engaged or when they're under uh, stress. We can uh, listen to, not listen, we can sample people's breath. And based on the change in their uh, chemical composition of the breath, 
You can also track it to their emotional state throughout the day, such as when they were watching um, the movie Hunger Games Girls on Fire. And uh, as she mentions, we're leaving the era of poker face and entering into the era of the empath, meaning that our tools and our surroundings will be able to map to our uh, internal uh, state. Even if we aren't uh, speaking or telling these uh, devices what that is. An interesting way that this may play out is through the ear and that you can use the ear as a bi-directional um, modality to collect, um, one, you have omnidirectional awareness, you have a rich psychological state information from uh, what people are hearing, and then you can actually place a number of sensors uh, in the ear to be able to look at gaze direction, mental gestures, cognitive load, stress, scene you know, awareness, and um, I, I do think that the ear actually will become a, a crucial place for hearables. I, I've been uh, discussing this for a number of years. The fact that I do think uh, most people will have a hearable that they wear in their ear sometime in the uh, coming years, both to receive information as well as to quantify information about them. She mentions the fact that our homunculus, which is that uh, diagram of the human body proportionate to the sensory inputs, is changing over time. Even three years from now, it will look different from how that looks today. And when we look at the homunculus of today versus the homunculus of a few decades ago, you know, right now we would quantify our thumbs as much higher sensory inputs into our body than uh, previously before. But the real uh, genius of uh, humans is the plasticity of our mind and being able to adapt to different uh, neural inputs. And the thought is that as our technology begins to uh, grow at accelerated and rapid paces, that we'll be able to adapt to these and uh, make use of them in our sensory experience because of the plasticity of the human mind. C cool work here. In some ways, you know, it really does sound a bit like a Blade Runner as we saw earlier with those uh, pupil diameter uh, assessments to understand our physiologic state. Let's move on to the next presentation. David Caro, Human Longevity Institute, big institution which has been uh, you know in the news for a fair bit over the last few years, especially connected with exponential medicine and the Singularity University group. This was a cool presentation to understand <clears throat> a little bit more concretely some of the data which they are showing. The first starts with uh, why, in some ways, human longevity and the health nucleus was founded. And the reason for this was that although we had genetic data from genome sequencing, we really hadn't made advancements yet in trying to understand our health. And so what they wanted to do was to bring all the different modalities we had for uh, phenotype measurement of the human body, uh, you know, MRIs, echoes, EKG, um, and uh, correlate those with genomic microbiome and uh, genetic data. And what they ended up finding was very interesting. And I remember, the people who came to human nucleus for these tests were people who were previously considered healthy, many of them. And they really uh, had gone to the executive physicals at places like Mayo or Cleveland Clinic. And so they had gotten what we'd call the gold standard of contemporary uh, executive physicals. These are the findings, and they're really interesting. So of the 1,200 people that had gone through health nucleus, 2% had a new brain uh, or aortic aneurysm, 2% a new tumor suspected or confirmed with many high-grade cancers in early stage, 19% had moderate atherosclerotic uh, coronary disease, 43% uh, elevated fatty liver, 84% were genetic carriers for recessive disease, of which 24 had a rare genetic mutation that actually affected their health. 3.4% um, had newfound AFib or uh, bundle branch block or high AV block. And 15% uh, had an aberrant cardiac structure or function. Uh, several case studies were presented such as a uh, case of lymphoma, which was discovered, um, thyroid cancer, which resulted in uh, surgery the, the week after discovery, 
in a young 34-year-old lady, high-grade prostate cancer. These are the ones which actually kill people, uh, not the low-grade ones, which people uh, aren't harmed by. A 54-year-old a uh, healthy non-smoking female with a lung adenocarcinoma, two centimeter finding on the MRI. Prostate uh, cancer we already discussed. Uh, fatty liver, you know, as we've already discussed, this puts you at risk for cirrhosis, of which the best benefit is uh, weight loss, as we know. Brain aneurysm in a 49-year-old female, you know, eight millimeters, uh, went for surgery very quickly after this. Uh, advanced coronary artery disease. This is someone who's 45, essentially a healthy female who was found to have a calcium score at the 99th percent for their age and gender. You know, this type of information <coughs> is something that someone would change their uh, lifestyle and be want to know about. And in the end, they just found that 40% of clients had an actionable finding, of which um, 15% were uh, very significant findings, and then 40% were of uh, long-term value. And so what they're trying to do at Health Nucleus is, oh, one last thing, uh, the genetic findings, you know, 25% of patients had uh, genetic findings, which they were able to uh, apply both to that patient as well as to helping their um, immediate family understand their conditions better. The thought is that at Health Nucleus, they've added one to nine years of life by using their platform, and there were some uh, metrics to suggest this. You know, the hope is that we can get to something called precision wellness, where you'll be able to take someone, perhaps at age 40, put them through a whole body MRI machine, combine that with whole genome sequencing data, and the two of these together can help really predict what people's uh, lifetime and short-term risks of disease are, and then be able to intervene on those and modify the risk factors. The concern is that one in three people who live to age 50 don't live to age 75, and that is because of premature mortality from chronic age-related disease. And the hope would be that we could reduce this one-third of people who die from something which is potentially modifiable or actionable um, that we can, and the way that this is going to be done, as I suggested, uh, is that they're going to use home ge whole genome sequencing, whole body MRI, and analyze these two so with AI and machine learning sources. This is a very different uh, way which we understand healthcare than today, where we simply ask you for your family history. We do a uh, cursory superficial physical examination of external structures, and then we talk to the physician to try to integrate this data. And uh, right now we know, of course, that we're trying to add both genomics, imaging, microbiome, medical records, metabiolomics, and serum testing. The really high-value tests uh, that they were mentioning really are the MRI, though, and the genomics. And one of the ways to show how they're using this is you bring all this information together, and you can create a risk score for what someone's risk of dementia is. And there are modifiable risk factors, and you can show people that if they uh, follow and modify those risk factors, how their risk of dementia uh, will change. And so this is not aggregate dis risks. These are personalized risk scores as well as personalized um, benefit scores. And we saw something similar up with what Khalid was doing with their eye health app. Again, we're trying to um, really quantify and predict what risk is and then show people how they can modify that risk. And this is, I think, the really uh, important takeaway from these morning lectures is being able to help make it so that behavioral change uh, is more actionable, that people um, can actually change their behavior before it's too late, which is this, of course, one of the holy grails of medicine is how do we actually change um, behavior in the area of pre preventable chronic conditions. And, um, you know, the thought is, as I mentioned, that everyone probably at age 40 may have a full body MRI. All right, we'll move into session eight now. AI for good, clinical acceleration. So the first is by uh, Rachel Thomas, who's also one of the founders and researchers at Fast AI. We had seen uh, one of her colleagues yesterday also give one of the presentations. She gave uh, some great case examples of what the work in 
the AI students taking their online class have done. They've had over 200,000 students take that class. And uh, many of these people are, again, people without advanced uh, understandings of mathematics, without advanced or prior knowledge of ML. Their only background is doing at least one year of coding. And they're able to use these tools to actually become leaders in their respective fields. And so the five myths that she discussed about AI, the first being that you uh, need big data, and some of the systems were being done with sets even of 30 uh, examples or a thousand training images. The second is that deep learning works only for a very limited number of problems, such as imaging problems. That's just, you know, a myth because imaging problems are popular now, but we can use deep learning on tabular data or time series data or text data. There's a myth that you need an expensive computer. You can uh, use online cloud computing for 40 cents an hour. And so in their course, which you need about 70 hours of cloud computing would cost you about $30 to take. There is concern that deep learning will replace domain experts, but what they've really seen in fast AI is that domain experts are incredibly important in understanding um, what machine learning algorithms are suggesting is the correct answer and how to interpret this and how we the, can be tweaked to get more uh, clinically relevant results. And last, the thought that you need to hire deep learning PhD students from Stanford. And as she mentioned that the people um, you have in your organization already with some uh, base level of coding can add on AL, sorry, AI and machine learning as a new skill to their skill set. They don't need to go back to Stanford. They don't need to get a PhD to be able to actually reap the benefits of these new tools, which gets me really excited about uh, this. Next presentation by Alan, and he's a PhD physician from Google DeepMind over at... Um, Moore Hospital in the UK. He discussed, of course, the work that Google has done with uh, the um, Moorefields Eye Hospital, and we'd seen a lot of this published in the last year. The, the real benefit, uh, so the real presentation started looking at the fact that healthcare systems are facing the same challenges as far as uh, increasing costs, uh, harm from patients, not evidence-based care, staff burnout, uh, failed to share decision-making with patients and focusing on illness rather than prevention. And the hope being that we'll be able to overcome a lot of these challenges through the use of uh, machine-aided prediction. In particular, his area of interest in eyes discusses the fact that 30 million people around the world um, have preventable sight loss. Sorry, 30 a million people around the world end up getting um, sight loss, of which the thought is 80 to 90 percent is preventable. Now, a part of the gold standard for evaluation of this is OCT, or optical coherence tomography. And this is looking at the retina of the eye. And the work that they published here just recently in uh, Nature Medicine was showing how they could use their systems for triage and how it wouldn't miss any of the urgent systems, and how when you zoom in and you look at the our area under the curve of the AI system compared to experts, that the AI system was uh, comparable and even exceeded that of experts for I think it was uh, 50 different eye conditions, and very impressive work to be able to bring uh, AI level um, expertise and knowledge and triage to essentially anyone who runs the software. Of course, we have the black box problem, being that we want to know how, why a algorithm thinks the way it does, but currently uh, we don't have the insight to be able to uh, understand this. It's a black box. And part of the way that they were trying to resolve this is by visually showing the clinician the certainty ratios for the different um, ways that the algorithm has quantified the OCT retinal imaging. And so in this case here, some of the uh, red tissue was flickering in and out in the video, and that flickering was to indicate that there was uncertainty about the machine's uh, calling of that structure as abnormal vascular. We can also use this type of uh, machine learning prediction to do education. So the thought was that the trainee circled 
what they thought was uh, fluid in the tissue layer, and then the machine went through and circled what it thought was uh, the correct answer. And so by looking at the discordance, you could uh, use it as a training tool for uh, education. The training data sets don't need to be enormous. One of the examples proposed showed it, uh, a set of only 650 images to uh, work on the algorithm. And of course, they're moving into uh, try to use this technique on screening breast exams. In the UK, uh, you know, that you need two physicians to read each mammography result. And the fact that, you know, all women aged 50 to 70 are asked for screening every three years is a very high cost and very high number of personnel required. And so potentially uh, ML will be able to greatly assist in this. They're also working in the U.S. with Veterans Affairs, trying to develop algorithms to detect clinical deterioration before it happens for hospitalized patients. And one of the big important things uh, that was pointed out is, of course, we need to get the work being done in clinical AI. The results need to ultimately be uh, fed into the appropriate clinical workflows so that they're available uh, when needed. And uh, Google DeepMind involves patients at all points of their uh, project development. One of the hopes was that in about five years' time, AI won't be seen as a tool out there to be discussed at conferences or only in papers, but AI will just be another routine tool in medicine that will be subject to the same peer review evidence that clinicians and patients are comfortable with. And that's kind of the expression that um, was presented here by Alan, which is a very reasonable uh, short-term goal here for AI. We move into the next presentation, which was on Fujifilm and healthcare. And uh, Juan Fernando, who's the COO there at Fujifilm Health, discussed how uh, Fujifilm is creating a platform which is called uh, Rely. And the hope from what I can tell if you look on their website is that this tool will incorporate uh, AI tools, both their own from Fujifilm as well as third-party AI tools, and it will integrate into a PAX workflow. And this means that they're trying to create, in some ways, an open um, platform, being able to pull in uh, third-party AI tools, but at the same time, Fujifilm is trying to really um, corner that AI workflow experience. And we see some other uh, slides uh, showing how they're trying to ultimately create an experience on Rely where you do uh, triage, where you do initial AI assessments. And this is all part of the single uh, PAX uh, system. And so if you're interested to learn more about the integration of this tool and how it can work, there is a video and you can go to the Fujifilm website. We next had a presentation by uh, Rajiv Ronanki from uh, Anthem talking about the different ways that AI is currently being used for process in, uh, automation, for insight generation, for personalized engagement, and how they're trying to uh, combine all this together to uh, one ecosystem. And, you know, of course, AI isn't perfect. And he presented some examples of times when AI has gone wild and uh, ways which this can try to be mitigated. The next session, uh, we moved into session nine on reimagining regulation in clinical trials. This was really interesting presentation by Asif Dahar from Deloitte Consulting, showing the work that the FDA is doing in trying to create new processes for software clearance. A lot of this work, uh, part of the precipitating catalyst, came out of previous exponential medicine uh, conferences. And the really cool thing to see was that the mindset at the FDA was clearly uh, looking very much ahead and changing, trying to react to the promise of new software technologies and realizing that software is a very different way uh, of approaching FDA clearance than something like hardware or medication, where a hardware or medication is in an end state, or software is a tool which undergoes change over time. This is just showing some of the um, recent innovations from 2013 to 2016 and in the last two years, moving towards uh, white papers from the FDA on digital health innovation plans. And so the thought is, as software as a medical device, 
which is a different way to think about software. In the past, it was software was within a medical device. And in this new category of software as a medical device, really, you know, it is a paradigm shift to being able to produce something which you can deploy rapidly, that you will be able to have lots of data tracking about that device in production. If you compare this, for instance, to uh, medications or uh, hardware where your ability to track the data on those uh, medication or hardware usage is much more difficult than a piece of software. And then you also uh, have in digital health potential for very exponential increases in the volume of users uh, compared to a physical goods such as a hardware or a drug. So, you know, these slides are again from the FDA showing their goals for a new model of healthcare. And really what they're trying to create is a process which can be streamlined, where the FDA can look at what your software is trying to do, what the risk of making a mistake is versus the potential benefits, and then based on the amount of data that you're able to share back with the FDA, uh, put you into different uh, streamlined uh, approval processes. It was kind of compared in a few ways to the um, you know, uh, air flight and traffic authority, where if you have uh, shared your information with the border guard, um, you know, if you have a Nexus card in Canada or in the U.S., you can get across the border quicker. And that's because you've uh, pre-shared more data ahead of time with the organization. And therefore, they were able to uh, sort of expedite your process of getting across the border. And so similarly here with the FDA, the thought is if you share more information, uh, and you, they can help streamline the software reviews. They have a very aggressive timeline on trying to get this work done the next a year or two. And the worry, of course, is that many people are becoming interested in healthcare and developing software applications, but we don't want to lose uh, this excitement. And if people come to the conclusion that working in healthcare is too hard, that there's too much regulation, that uh, working with the FDA uh, is too uh, outdated in their approach that we're going to lose a lot of this innovation coming into healthcare from external non-medical uh, fields. And so interesting work here. There's certainly going to be a lot of updates in the coming months. We move into a uh, presentation from uh, Mount Sinai with uh, Arish Artreja here. And he was discussing a lot of the work being done there at Mount Sinai. And one of the interesting things is that we finally have a business driver to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, before, there was all the incentive to want to try to uh, admit patients for long admissions, whereas with the shift, as we've been discussing in the last two days of uh, healthcare payments, there's now incentive to try to actually use tools and technologies to keep people out of the hospital. And his thought was that we need to go beyond the electronic health record when we think about medical uh, IT and informatics, uh, and look at how we can uh, create, you know, direct to patient applications and actually validate these. So the first FDA approved app was in 2001, and it showed in an RCT a 1.2% A1C decline over a year. Now, of course, this is a tremendous finding, which is comparable to billion dollar drugs, and it was with an FDA approved app. We moved into other studies which he showed looking at how AI-driven text messaging can reduce LDL, blood pressure, BMI, and smoking. Again, we're, we're getting therapeutic benefits which match that and sometimes even exceed that of pharmacologic interventions simply with um, applications, text messaging, and tools. They mentioned that we have more digital biomarkers such as sensors which can uh, know if someone is uh, smoking. There was an FDA-approved pill, which will be able to now uh, know if someone has both ingested the pill as well as when it gets defecated. And their uh, vision for care by 2020 there at Mount Sinai, which is you know, just two years away, is to be able to do telemedicine and messaging through virtual care, 24-hour remote tracking, more population health with predictive analytics, uh, more peer networks, and really start prescribing apps. You know, digital therapeutics is the the, uh, the term being used here. And of course, a lot of the work which he has done in this area is creating this uh, node health 
um, company and network, which is a network of 32 different health systems, as well as HIMSS and AMA and Academy of Health. And what they're trying to do is to build uh, the largest health technology validation network so that you can bring your health technology innovation to this uh, Node Health group. They can incorporate it into a health workflow. Within nine months, you can have the evidence to show the FDA that your product works. This obviously involves building a digital information and digital integration ecosystem uh, built upon you know, Spart and Fire. And as you can see here in the slide, uh, connecting all these different uh, curated and prescribed tools together. The hope is that you'll be able to do rapid patient recruitment. An example is presented of recruiting patients for one of the trials in just a single day to be able to get uh, you know, 206 patients consented. And the long-term goal is to be able to essentially have uh, long-term digital health, patient health plans. So you can imagine a patient with uh, cardiac disease going through many different phases from being high risk to having angina to then getting a stent to then being post stent to then having an actual heart attack to then being post heart attack, uh, then eventually developing heart failure. And each of these different steps along this uh, care journey could benefit from different types of digital health tools and digital health interventions. And so the hope would be here at Node Health that you could actually identify where in this health journey your tool fits and then be able to deploy that to those types of patients for research and validation and ultimately e-prescribing. Next presentation was by Hansa Bargarva from uh, WebMD. And the big concern which was being addressed was that in the US maternal mortality is actually increasing. They only rank 77th in the world actually as far as maternal health care. And so what they did is at WebMD, they said, we've got a large number of people which come to our organization. In fact, it's 76 million unique monthly users, of which 74% come on mobile. And we know that pregnant women uh, download uh, mobile health apps. You know, 55% of, of pregnant women do so. And so they worked with Scripps to create a tool uh, called Powerbomb uh, WebMD, where they uh, enrolled patients uh, over 2,000 were finally enrolled from all over the United States, and then they began to uh, understand more about this patient population and try to create more uh, understandings. And so this is an interesting way in that how WebMD is looking to try to get into more uh, better diagnostics. At the break, uh, Stefano Bini talked, and you know he mentioned in the past that he used, uh, used to lament a lot about how bad the EHRs are, and you know I know this from firsthand. We've had conversations before at other conferences, but the new insight was that it's not just EHR companies which have a self-interest in keeping data within their own system, but it's actually the entire health system which has a self-interest in preventing data from getting out, right? Because if your data could easily get out of the health system, then you as a patient are more portable and can go to the health system down the road, which is, you know, obviously not in your the first health system's interest. And the other interesting comment he made was about one of the benefits of robots and surgery is that it's going to reduce variability. And as we reduce variability in surgery, it means that we can actually uh, predict outcomes better and outcomes will be more certain. And this changes our risk models on the way which uh, surgery is paid for. We move into some more sessions then in the afternoon. We go into smart and healthy communities, of course, starting with Lucien from a Reshape and Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. And he talked about the fact that in some ways, he feels like he works on a different planet because the Netherlands, of course, uh, is very advanced in Europe. They're ranked uh, number one in their healthcare system for at least the last seven years in a row, according to the European Health Consumer Index. And unfortunately, you know, still a lot of the way which healthcare is done uh, doesn't make sense. He gives the example to quote him or to paraphrase is you have to take a day off work, then you have to get in a car and burn fossil fuels to get to an office where you have to drive through uh, to find the last parking spot, to rush to the front desk at the office, to then be told that the doctor is running late and you need to wait. And then afterwards, you can then get back in your car and drive with fossil fuels back home. And 
he presents this concept of digital human avatars as which something which is likely going to profoundly change our understanding of how we interact with healthcare. Very uh, impressive, the three renderings of the avatars today, even compared to two or three years ago. And the hard part, though, of healthcare, more than even the technology, leadership, or strategy, is actually the culture of which we're trying to deploy these innovations in. There's an interesting graph presented on the number of years to reach 100 million people. For air travel, it took 70 years. For telephone, it took 50 years. The PC needed 14 years, the internet seven years, and Facebook four years. Instagram, to reach the 100 million people mark, only needed two months. And so being able to deploy digital health solutions uh, at scale is becoming more rapidly and rapidly possible in how technology is going to change and impact healthcare. Interesting graph here, and this was from his book, Augmented Healthcare, which is a good read. It shows all the number of non-traditional companies getting into the healthcare space just even in the last year and a half. And these are groups with investments of over 10 million. You know, Amazon, Alibaba, Apple, um, Google, Samsung, uh, And one of the terms he uh, used was that the healthcare user experience, which he called HUX, is broken. He talked about a Copernican moment. And in the past, we, of course, you know, with Copernicus, it shifted our understanding of the universe of that the sun, sorry, that the earth moved around the sun. And so in healthcare, our Copernican move, uh, moment is that healthcare moves around the patient and not around the healthcare professional. Now, when looking at digital strategy, it's important to not think about translating, um, you know, how do you do what you do now into a digital format, is to entirely think about what you do uh, from the ground up using a digital uh, methodology. And from my perspective, this is really important because the way we've been approaching healthcare over the last few years is simply saying, how can we do what we already do using digital tools when we really need to rethink how we would uh, move from the analog process to a digital process, which is an entirely different mindset. And we see companies are doing this, moving from digitizing, such as through apps, to creating digital uh, transition where we're automating something which is now digital through the, for instance, an Apple, such as their health kit ecosystem, to then actually creating digital transformation where uh, you you know we see Apple are creating their own health clinics for their internal employees. We see in the case of Amazon, you have uh, digitizing the logistics and data center. You go through digital transition, such as uh, creating brick and mortar stores. And now you're able to do the digital transformation of bringing that uh, digitized um, new front of healthcare, of which it's going to be very interesting to see that what Amazon does with their Berkshire J.P. Morgan company. Now, of course, as we've been discussing, the goal is really predictive analytics, and the hope is that you'd be able to uh, predict, for instance, in this case, they're showing results of their trial where they can uh, predict 30 minutes before a patient has an episode of hypoglycemia based off of their uh, heart rate variability and their blood glucose readings that this is about to happen. Very cool to see that they used heart rate variability as a surrogate marker or as a comparable variable as you can see here to uh, blood glucose in this trial they were doing there at Radabound. The thought is that as we move into a digital first, physical next mentality in healthcare, the way that healthcare is structured and organized is going to look dramatically different. A comparable example being the way that we do stock trading. Of course, the picture on the left is the 1960s stock exchange. You have uh, thousands of people shouting at each other in a room. And today, only 3% of stocks are actually traded using humans. How is healthcare going to uh, undergo a similar process, for instance? Uh, here we have a picture of an ICU nurse who's able to monitor 250 different patients, uh, all from a single uh, point and desk. So in some ways, healthcare is becoming a software branch. We then saw a presentation from uh, Eric Gertstein, who's the Secretary General, Ministry of Health in the Netherlands, gave case examples of uh, you know patients with uh, very complex needs on how they're able to use telehealth, 
and uh, online patient portals and patient communities uh, truly cut down on the burden of receiving health care. They also had a video, which you can watch online, of a project called uh, MedMeach from Dutch, which uses HL7 Fire Interface to allow people to uh, connect their different records from different organizations and systems into one uh, patient platform. Interesting mention of GPS technology there in the Netherlands, using it for uh, patients and elderly with dementia, allowing them to wander freely and uh, know where they are. And of course, this reduces chemical restraints, slows the progression of disease, and actually improves the quality of life. The next presentation is by Elizabeth Canis from Atham, who uh, really focused on the fact that it's important to realize how uh, healthcare is a uh, local issue, that you get local market dynamics and local healthcare uh, reg uh, issues, and we can't uh, lose fact to that when we're thinking about healthcare on a global level. She mentioned an interesting fact from a Kaiser physician she had heard years ago, that their high chronically ill patients at there would spend about 700 to 800 minutes per year uh, with a physician, which is not even 15 hours. And, you know, of course, wondering how, how that's going to change with the opportunities we have with uh, digital health. Move into the next presentations now on digital surgery. Uh, Shafi talked about the very first robot-assisted surgery happening in 2001 with the transatlantic uh, surgery within the Lindbergh operation in France. He also then uh, discussed how AR surgery is already happening with uh, FDA approval just last week on a HoloLens instance. And he was really wondering, of course, you know, uh, how the work which we're doing uh, in trying to create digital assistance and robotics in surgery is going to provide a lot more information in the space of surgical outcomes and really quantifying uh, surgical performance. Currently, we look at things such as mortality, but in general, this is a very crude outcome. What we really want to create more is a black box uh, for the operating theater, similar to the black box on a flight plane, where you can capture all the crucial data and uh, learn from those mistakes um, going into the future. Building on top of this, we move into the next presentation by Carla Pugh uh, from Stanford. Really cool work here. So she spent the last uh, 17 years really working on trying to understand how we can uh, quantify surgery much more accurately than we currently do. Right now, uh, after a operation, the physician will dictate an operative report. They'll use certain terms such as the trocar was inserted with ease, or there's extensive adhesions, but the question really is, what does this mean? These are uh, subjective terms based off of what the physician has dictated into the report, and this makes trying to do quality outcome research, of course, in surgery, uh, very difficult. It's not standardized, and uh, what she's done in her research is essentially place uh, sensors of all different types onto um, operating uh, simulations, and she's done 30 different clinical scenarios with over 18,000 uh, physician encounters. And so, for instance, she can, in this uh, setup here of a simulated OR, bring 100 different physicians in uh, to that OR and have them do the same simulator procedure. From that, she is able to generate uh, detailed haptic information of all the tools that they were using um, and then this data can ultimately create a fingerprint of what is the expected or normative uh, set of movements to perform that procedure, of which she said, you know, as much as people claim that there's incredible variation, whether you start on the left or on the right or on the top or on the bottom, uh, that ultimately when you get down to the actual organ structure, the variation in movements required to execute the uh, necessary techniques are surprisingly uh, low in variation. And so with this information, you can then uh, ha bring in a surgical trainee and have them perform the same skills as the others. And you can actually quantify using objective data, for instance, that someone is having difficulty with a particular uh, surgical technique, such as depth, depth perception. 
Um, this motion data is being used in many other ways. For instance, they're comparing what's called the final product grade, you know, how much overlap was there between your surgical mesh and the tissue. And that will be graded on how well the outcome of the surgery looks from a visual perspective. And then you can map that uh, final repair score to the actual motion data and then be able to actually quantify based off the smoothness of the motion data, based on how long the paths people followed when moving the instruments, um, what their outcome is going to be before the outcome has even happened. And um, you, this data can even be used within the first anchoring suture. So within the first five minutes uh, of capturing this motion data, she can um, almost uh, predict how good or how competent or qualified someone is to perform the operation. And ultimately, all this data will not only be useful for training, for uh, feedback for the clinicians to understand how they can improve and get better, but can be fed the motion data, the force data, and the video and audio and sensor data back into the uh, patient's medical record, both for digital documentation of their uh, surgical experience, but also for uh, aggregate um, medical research in the future. Cool work. Next presentation, uh, Gene Hamm from Touch Surgery, a uh, physician and co-founder, talked about how he and a friend tried, built Touch Surgery a few years ago as a way to take surgeons and trainees step-by-step uh, -step through an operation and allows them to learn to test themselves and to rehearse before procedures. This has really exploded over the last few years into a complete global platform. We have here, uh, you know, over a quarter of a million surgeons have attended it. Um, and it's interesting that patients are interested in it as well. It's the top five medical app in the store, and it's available for free. And what they've been able to do and what they've spent a lot of time doing is trying to build this digital roadmap for surgery. For instance, to know uh, which particular parts of the surgery may be more high risk or have different variations or techniques and be able to alert physicians uh, to these steps as they're rehearsing. They've done this for over 200 different procedures across every uh, major different surgical specialty, and the results they're having are uh, scientifically validated. For instance, uh, those uh, students who use this tool for training end up uh, having better cognitive knowledge as well as improved OR performance. They also randomized uh, people to train on using the app versus uh, other s controls such as watching a video. And then they performed a lap coli. And those who used their app as the model were able to um, actually have a better uh, performance in the OR in uh, multiple different fields by a factor of two. The same uh, was replicated in a study they did for uh, chest tube insertion. Again, an RCT using this tool versus alternatives and better outcomes again were uh, determined as far as surgical skill. This product is particularly useful for those in low middle income countries where um, you may not have access to as much types of training. And it's even also being used by uh, advanced clinicians uh, to prepare and to rehearse for surgery. And so some of the ways that this is being used as a preparation tool is they're experimenting being able to take actual patient detail such as an MRI from that patient, and then build that patient-specific anatomy into the application so that you can walk through uh, the actual steps that will be required for that very patient and their anatomy, which is particularly useful for those with complex cases. And where is this going? Well, it's really cool. The thought is that you can essentially cre create a real-time surgery guidance system, meaning that you can put cameras in the OR uh, to watch the operation. It can map the organ structures in real time using AI. This real-time data can be then compared against the guidance system's um, repository of what that clinical map should look like of the next steps. And then it can tell the surgeon, for instance, the step that they're at, the tools that are required, and what is required in the next field. So that means that the uh, scrub tech will know what is the next tool coming, that the surgeon will know if the step they're about to take might be particularly high risk or some features that they may want to uh, just keep in the back of their mind. And the hope is that uh, all this is going to benefit the global surgery um, 
oh, sorry, this is just an image. As you can see, there's a screen for the physician and a screen for the scrub tech, each telling them uh, different tools uh, and information about the steps in real time. This is really cool work. And of course, the hope is that this is going to affect the global surgery uh, market again. You know, over 150 million procedures uh, aren't done a year, which are likely need to be 5 billion people don't have access to safe surgery. Um, there's a lot of benefits to this type of technologies. Stefano uh, Bini talked a lot about um, the idea of the adjacent and possible, which is from Steve Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From, talking about the idea of technologic adjacencies, such as their, the tools and the technologies uh, directly uh, next in line and related to the work you're doing. And then you have social adjacencies, which are uh, those laws and governance factors which are uh, around the work you're doing. And it's often those uh, social adjacencies which may uh, slow innovation, and it's those technologic adjacencies which is where you're moving innovation into. Um, similar to before, as we've been discussing, these alternative payment models, these APMs, whether it's paper for performance or bundled care, Medicare Advantage or accountable care orgs or integrated delivery networks, these new different alternative payment models are creating an incentive where and actually forcing providers to assume risk, whereas before it was all on the side of the payers. And by forcing providers to assume risk, providers are trying to really understand uh, patient's risk as well as provider performance much better. So one example provided is a group called Clarify Health, which is specifically looking at the area of orthopedics, as this is one of the earlier areas uh, where risk is being transferred, and by risk I mean uh, who's paying for it. And uh, what they try to do is to clarify using you know over 200 different risk factors about a patient, what that patient's stratified risk is. And then uh, conversely, on the other side of the equation, they're trying to uh, figure out which specialists add the most value, uh, what their performance is, what type of case mix they're able to take on board, uh, what their episode costs are. Some other things discussed, of course, is the cool work being done in exoskeletons, uh, microelectric, uh, prosth myoelectric prosthetics, um, trying to reduce the costs after an operational hospitalization, right? One-fifth of those costs are actually incurred afterwards from physiotherapy and rehab, trying to understand which patients actually require the rehab and which patients uh, don't require it. And um, new work, of course, being done with 3D printed implants. Two examples uh, given was that at the University uh, UC Health Colorado, they implemented an AI scheduling tool and they increased the revenue by 4% a year, and they actually released 40% more uh, OR blocks. And then there was a, a company called Cloud Medics, and essentially, when residents took a particular board exam, they got about 68 to 81% on the test. They took them two and a half hours. When Cloud Medics, the AI, wrote it, it took only five minutes, and it got a score of 85%. And then um, when residents wrote the test using AI, the score was 91%, which um, is kind of similar to what was mentioned in the previous presentation by Jean, who mentioned that... Um, you know, to quote him, computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. Human beings are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant. Uh, together, they are powerful beyond imagination. And here we're seeing some quantitative data showing that. To end, uh, this image of a mobile surgical suite was shown, and the idea of could we in the future combine a robot almost with a medical student, and would they be able to carry out an operation as competently and successfully uh, as the expert clinician who actually designed the system. And when you take that type of uh, robot and a uh, worker with less training, combine them into a mobile surgical suite, you're really solving some of the access problems to surgery. We'll transition now to session 12, and we'll start off by talking about uh, technology and the fact that as we've added technology, we've introduced complexity. And of course, complexity actually creates danger and endangers lives in healthcare in some ways. And so this was a session on voice, talking about how voice is perhaps one of the most natural tools in healthcare and how it's really going to transform things. The first was discussing five ways in which 
uh, or five reasons that the tech titans are discussing voice at the moment and really fighting over it as a tool. The first involves discovery, meaning that the way that you get onto many of these platforms, whether it's Amazon or Google, is by searching for something. You're trying to buy something or answer a question. And so voice is going to be the natural way to do this. The second is on sound. Sound meaning not your voice, but the sounds around you as you record your voice carry an incredible amount of metadata about where you are uh, and trying to uh, incorporate this into the algorithms will be incredibly useful. And we know that sound is useful uh, because and voice because the black box and planes really have these two features on them and they're able to deduce an uh, incredible amount. The third is convenience, of course, that um, we had a tremendous leap forward in user interface design uh, simply with the introduction of touch screen and touch interfaces. And he thinks that voice is actually going to be an even greater leap forward in user interface design because the uh, convenience of using your voice rather than even having to input using your hands is that much higher. Not to mention that it actually reduces cognitive load compared to having to type. The um, fourth uh, reason that this is important is that voice and sound are incredibly uh, intimate, meaning that it, on Instagram you can take a picture and it can almost be a small slice of your life, um, and it can in some ways be a lot um, more fake, whereas uh, voice and sound is re the real world, and it's harder to lie. It's a more accurate representation of what uh, is happening in your life and the people you're interacting with. And then there's, of course, the question of where will cultural norms end? Um, you know, right now, we have a microphone with us, but it's off all the time. If we use a trigger word, it will activate the microphone uh, to record and pay attention. But there would be potential benefits for AI or for voice to hearing us all the time, to always being on. It would know uh, our thoughts, our uh, people we interact with, our preferences, and in some ways make AI much more useful and at this other times be uh, much more creepy. A uh, comparable example being presented was on CCTV cameras. When they first were introduced you know, into airports and school, many people were concerned. Right now, that's become the norm. Uh, and now we discuss body cams on law enforcement. That was kind of the more recent uh, debate on cameras. And so cultural norms uh, do shift over time. One of the discussions we'll need to have is about that on voice. And finally, you know, voice is a tool and technology which is deployed in the cloud, meaning that you don't require much hardware for it and the hardware required doesn't change frequently, allowing more rapid iteration and more rapid software updates. Here's a great slide showing the difference between type and voice. Uh, you can type with your fingers about 30 words per minute. In voice, you can speak about 160, probably a little bit faster in this presentation. And then your data throughput, uh, when you compare this. In voice, you're looking at about 64 kilohertz of data throughput, whereas uh, in text, sorry, in texting, you really have 22 bits, uh, comparable data. And in voice, you're, of course, capturing more emotion content, um, metadata from the surrounding uh, area, speech, inflection, you know, in text, we're really able to just capture a small amount of this using emojis. Some of the ways that voice is, of course, being used uh, right now is, for instance, with the U.S. Coast Guard, they're having an issue with hoax calls and prank calls. And so by using voice uh, technology, they can now tell the difference between someone who actually is in distress and who's just drunk calling. Um, and based on the background sound meta-analysis, you can determine if they're actually on a ship or if, you know, they're in someone's basement. And so the thought is that uh, there was many factors that came together to make the touch interface the uh, interface of the 2000s, and this involved many patents back from the 1960s and 1970s. It involved uh, changes to the price points for a lot of things, such as uh, lithium-ion uh, batteries for flash memory, for uh, low-power processors, for cellular networks, for capacitive touchscreen technology. And this all came together, finally, in the 2000s to really make touchscreen interfaces take off. And so it's proposed uh, that there are a similar coalition of forces right now, which is making a voice the interface of our time, that we have the ability to do deep learning, 
uh, and natural language processing on the voice data that we have large data sets now of digital spoken voices to do training on, that we have the right parallel processing, compu cloud computing, and economies of scale to make it happen. And one of the interesting uh, thoughts when thinking about voice as a customer technology is that it's actually a very cheap customer technology relative to others. You know, laptops are looking at hundreds to thousands. Tablets are, again, hundreds to thousands. Um, same with gaming consoles at several hundred dollars. But potentially voice, uh, you can buy an Alexa or a Google Home for $40 dollars and then tap into this technology. And when you're trying to think about, um, you know, what would be areas to compete in for both uh, consumer-facing uh, games and toys and products for kids. A, a $40 home uh, voice tool is actually one of the cheapest technologies you could actually imagine. Moving this into the next presentation, John Brownstein from Boston Children's Harvard uh, talked about how voice is specifically being uh, looked at in healthcare and it really gave us a great overview of how we can use voice to help with uh, medical devices, wellness, um, vocal biomarkers, uh, pharmacy uh, procurement and payments, that it can help patients with, of course, speech synthesization or hearing difficulties, getting them involved with patient engagement, improving um, patient satisfaction and communication. It gave uh, quite a number of slides showing how you could use voice within your hospital in the operating theater, at the admission process, to help with compliance and checklists or protocols, uh, in the inpatient room for pain scores or to summon a nurse or to command the lights and the surroundings, uh, in the outpatient world to help uh, sort of complete pre-visit questionnaires without having to type in information, and uh, to help with remote monitoring of patients. Of course, you can also use uh, voice as a clinician, potentially in an actual patient room, to be able to set reminders to message other care team members. Um, you can use it in your clinical office. There's lots of work being done in trying to do uh, real-time physician notes uh, through voice. Uh, you can use it at the um, uh, home to also try to track uh, adherence to remind patients to uh, weigh themselves or to take medications and potentially even to uh, alert a healthcare system that someone's having a heart or a cardiac event based on changes in their voice. Now, the, the opportunity right now is voice of the, 20, of the 2020s, and this is coming out of websites and patient portals of the 2000s, mobile apps, and mHealth of the 2010s. And so voice and conversational assistance are just the third uh, phase in this um, progress of patient-facing uh, healthcare tools. Some pilots that they're doing in Boston Children's was placing uh, Amazon Alexas in the ICU to be able to get uh, clinical assignments, information uh, on demand, uh, open up policy documents, and uh, another example was being used uh, in the hospital for organ transplant verification process, surgical checklists, and to record events uh, during surgery. Of course, there are uh, concerns about voice and security, reliability, efficiency, uh, and just the frustration and effort to set up the system. Of course, it's not perfect to start, but we're really at a, a version zero right now when we think about the future of voice. One of the things I find interesting, which I didn't realize was being done so much work, which is using voice as a biomarker. How can we predict either sleep disorders such as apnea, respiratory, COPD, heart attacks, or coronary artery disease, uh, respiratory infections, or a whole spectrum of neurocognitive uh, disorders, whether it's dementia or phases or autism or ADHD or Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, depression or suicide, all based on people's uh, change in their own voice and their vocal fingerprints. It's interesting, too, to also view uh, voice as a right and the thought that we can uh, create a vocal uh, bank from a patient by having them speak into a system for several uh, minutes. And then we can then afterwards generate uh, sentences using their own native voice, which is a way to give back a voice uh, in a very personal way to people who have lost it because of um, medical disease. Ending on a quotation here that human imagination 
is a preview to the future. And it's really cool to try to understand what we might be able to do with these possibilities in voice. All right, we move into Dr. Panda here from the Salk Institute, who talked a lot about um, the fact that well, actually, it starts off with talking about in the United States, we have um, three to 24 people who receive no benefit for every drug. And these are the 10 highest um, grossing drugs in the U.S., meaning that many of the people that we're giving uh, drugs to actually are poorly selected. And of course, there's questions on how we can improve our selection uh, for medications, assuming that uh, we'll get better outcomes. But most of what he talked about was on circadian rhythms. Uh, very interesting work in here. So we know that our circadian rhythm right now is very different in modern times compared to our ancestors. In ancestors, we had a much um, longer period of a time without artificial light. And now, of course, because of natural light, we have um, more opportunities uh, for that. And the thought is that this is leading to circadian rhythm disruptions. And these disruptions are actually leading to a lot of the chronic diseases which we're seeing in everyone from babies to teenagers to adults and the elderly. And the thought is that um, th this can be reversed and prevented by understanding our circadian rhythm better. A particular insight into this came 16 years ago with the discovery of melopsin, which is a blue light sensing protein. And essentially, the this uh, protein during the night allows us to sleep, it allows melatonin to rise, and then during the day uh, synchronizes our other uh, brain clocks and circadian rhythms, raises our alertness, and reduces depression. Now, this is very important, and actually this research ultimately led to uh, the blue light filter on our phones because the fact that we were having too much exposure to blue light was uh, adversely affecting our health. And so now, of course, you know, all Apple products carry this blue light filter where the screens uh, remove the blue um, wavelength after a certain hour to naturalize these cycles. But there's a lot more work we can do to create a, quote, lighting revolution to promote better health. Um, and the thought is that this will help actually ameliorate many of these conditions from uh, different um, uh, depression, irritability, bipolar, Alzheimer's, panic, manic um, delirium. But the important thing to realize is that light was not the only factor which influences circadian rhythm. The other big one which was discussed is food. Very interesting uh, research was presented about what happens when food is eaten at the wrong time, meaning we just eat all around the clock, kind of like what we do today. Uh, I want to pull up the original papers from this because it's, uh, I think, very interesting research. And essentially what they did is an experiment where they took mice and they randomized them to based on when they ate. So one group ate within an eight-hour window and the other group of mice ate whenever they wanted. They both ate the same total amount of food and otherwise the mice were the same in the randomization. And what they found was at the end of 18 weeks, one group of mice, the one that was uh, eating within an eight-hour window, weighed 28% uh, less and uh, had 70% less body fat than the group which had become more obese and was eating around the clock. And then they repeated these experiments, trying to change different variables, eating at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 hour variables, uh, sometimes having the weekend off, other times trying high carb or high fructose or high sucrose or high fat diets. Again, you know, all these experiments are controlling the exact same total amount of calories. But what they found was that those mice which eat within an eight to 12 hour windows do the best. And you can even take mice which are sick and then um, subject them to an eight to 10 hour eating window. And this can reduce uh, various different um, um, health parameters and improve their health. And so the thought was, well, could we actually do this with humans? And there was a website called mycircadianclock.org where people were able to download an application and track uh, when they uh, ate you know, their first uh, consumption of food to their last within a day. Then 
they found that over 50% of sort of that 50% of people that were eating were eating for a uh, time of 15 hours a, a day or more and the thought was that they could take a group of those people who were using the application ask them to eat within a 10 hour window or less and then within 10 to 12 weeks they found that people were sleeping better uh, losing weight having um, better heart and cancer risks. Again, I want to find this original research, but I think it's very interesting. It actually almost mirrors a little bit of my own personal experience from uh, experimenting with this. And because we know that um, things such as the timing of surgery or your timing of flu shots and chemotherapy, depending on your circadian rhythms, the hope is that um, we can really use these type of research to understand how to be most effective uh, in our medical interventions treatment and uh, life. Again, trying to coordinate timing of things, move into a presentation by Jeffrey Bleach here, uh, CEO of Pulsion, looking at this concept of counter pace technology. And the simple thought is that we know um, that the best runners in the world run in a matter where they step during diastole. And the benefit is this, is that you're actually using your musculoskeletal system as a physical pump as you step uh, to move blood through your system. And this augments, of course, the uh, pump you have in your heart, uh, which is, I guess, the, the, all, the other pump which moves hard around your body. And we've uh, known, apparently, I didn't know about this actually, about a medical counter propulsion as a way to improve heart and brain benefits, specifically with, for instance, uh, revascularization um, of these areas. But the current tools that we have to do this are very uh, cumbersome. They're large beds or things are compressible um, pneumatic uh, tools which create a medical counter propulsion. And so the thought was that you can essentially put a heart rate monitor on someone, connect it to an app on their phone, and then time the pace as they run to uh, their diastole uh, in heartbeat, allowing them to uh, use essentially a natural counter propulsion, as we already know that 50% of elite athletes use. They already are doing this naturally. And when you hook up uh, elite US running athletes uh, and measure this, you get cool results. So the first part of this graph, you see the blood pressure is much higher and the heart rate is faster. And this is a result of, the, of having uh, no timing between the counter propulsion, between the actual running and between the heart rate. And then when you synchronize the two together, uh, the blood pressure drops 70 points and the heart rate also drops four to 10, seven, to four to 10 points. What this means overall, as we see in the next slide here, is that as the heart rate relaxes, your O2 delivered increases, your fat burned increases, and your breathing eases. All this combined actually uh, results in the fact that you um, are performing more efficiently, and they've done some uh, trials with college athletes where you can improve their 6K split time by 3%. We also know that brain flow to the blood increases, and there's multiple different uh, trials comparing true counter pace versus placebo, uh, in cardiology for CHF, for sports medicine, um, in different universities around the world. And this is, um, can it go even beyond, for instance, elite athletes trying to understand, for instance, in this area of CHF, could you time the uh, indwelling pacemaker, which already is uh, capturing someone's EKG and heart rate, uh, could you and accelerometer data, could you time the beating of a pacemaker to someone walking? Um, in some ways, helping improve uh, CHF uh, symptoms. Almost done here. Wow, there's a lot in this presentation. Uh, next, we get into uh, Julia, who uh, talked about a program called ALMA, where they take uh, students and youth and involve them in dance and activity with elders. And this uh, changes their perception of elders. It also is incredibly uh, beneficial uh, to both groups involved and really helps uh, reduce social isolation in the elderly, which is uh, a huge social issue. Uh, some conversations between Jack Crindler and Parker Mose. Uh, unfortunately, um, Parker's daughter uh, passed away um, several within the last year or two 
actually no, sorry, several years ago um, in the UK. And there was a very good discussion about the things we can do uh, to help cure cancer better, to think about cancer in different ways, to learn from our data, to uh, think of cancer more of a chess game where we actually need to plan for multiple steps uh, and for uh, almost mutation and resistance within cancer as we know that recurrence can be very common. And uh, we need to move into adaptive trials, meaning uh, not just randomized control trials. It's a conversation worth listening to. And very last, we talked about connecting the dots, uh, solutions at scale by Rashu Search. And the thought was that we're currently in an inflection point where as an organization, we may be seeing exponential growth through the adoption of these new health technologies, or potentially the failure to adopt them may result in a catastrophic decline. And the hope is that, um, you know, although everybody likes to innovate, the problem is that nobody likes to change. And we really need to change from uh, patient-centered healthcare models to uh, person-centered, meaning that as a healthcare system, we can't focus on only wanting to keep patients in hospital or build patients to come in, but we really need to view the hospital as the control center to keep people out of it. And now with as we've been discussing, changes in payment models, there's more incentive to do that. Uh, there at, at his hospital in um, UPMC, for instance, they will risk stratify heart failure patients prior to discharge and those with high risk send home with more monitoring equipment. There's a blind spot, which they're trying to solve, which is, of course, why do patients opt out of uh, interventions, which is very good question to try to understand uh, this group of patients better because this is the group which are actually going to have the highest healthcare costs. And a uh, few other quotations where uh, we need to move from surviving to thriving to not just add years to life, but to add life to years. And that, you know, when innovation is done right, it makes technology invisible. Well, that was a long presentation for a summary but there certainly was quite a lot of different, uh, very interesting results. Uh, studies here published uh, was uh, been two years since I was last at exponential medicine, and it's remarkable to see the changes which have occurred in this short amount of time. The conversation, the goalposts definitely are shifting and moving quite a lot uh, within you know even 12 to 24 months, and we'll see where the presentations are tomorrow when we look at day three of Singularity University's Exponential Medicine 2018.